right now. I really thought in that point of time, like I was going to die. And um, it was for sure like a near death experience. San Antonians caught in the horror in Houston tonight. Two women sharing the moments that they were caught in the middle of the chaos at Astro World and the trauma that they're dealing with right now. But first, here's what we know right now. A crowd surge led to the deaths of eight people during Astro World, among them a 14 year old. Multiple lawsuits have already been filed against Travis Scott, the rapper who was on stage when the surge began. Live Nation and others are also facing legal lawsuits tonight. The Houston Police Department now leading a criminal investigation into the chaos. Two women from San Antonio were there fighting to get out of that chaotic crowd during a festival gone terribly wrong. Imagine what they went through. The night beats Lee Waldman brings us the stories of these uh, women. So Lee, people that you spoke with share that this was an experience that it just it can't leave them. It's going to stay with them forever, right? Exactly. The, the two women I spoke with shared their experiences and the similarities between the two are extremely startling. Waves of people crushing each other, screams begging for help. This festival was a few days ago, but they say what they went through, they can't seem to shake it. Like I could have easily been those people who didn't get that help out of the crowd. Like what happened, what we saw, what we heard, you know, what is just still stuck in our heads, you know, like it's just all of that. Lasting trauma from what was supposed to be a weekend of music and fun. It just, it keeps playing in my head and it's just something that won't go away. Both Fatima Munoz and Stephanie Sandoval drove from San Antonio with their friends to go to Astro World. What happened at the show was like nothing they would have ever imagined. You know, nobody really helped me. I started screaming. I tried. I bit somebody's leg doing like trying to get attention. Days later, they cannot stop reliving those frightening moments of people's bodies being pushed and pulled from the crowd. Like, I haven't really slept or really eaten over just everything and just remembering their faces. Dr. Harry Croft is a psychiatrist, an expert when it comes to stress disorders after a traumatic experience. Most people have never been in a situation like uh, that occurred at Astro World. He explains after an event like this, symptoms of a stress disorder are common. So your feelings are probably normal. And, and so don't get all over yourself for experiencing those feelings. Feelings that both Munoz and Sandoval described, flashbacks of the event, not eating, not sleeping, even isolation all symptoms of acute stress disorder. They haven't had an official diagnosis, but for those who find themselves facing this mental trauma. They may not want to get out of their house. And actually the treatment is to be around people that you know and that you trust and that you care about. Now, Dr. Croft added that it is perfectly normal for symptoms of acute stress disorder to last for a few weeks. He encourages anyone dealing with these symptoms to go ahead and talk to a professional before things lead into PTSD. Steve, Stephania. All right, Lee, thank you. And you know what? There's so much more to this story. We invite you to visit KSAT.com because there we have an article about the chaos. Witnesses describing the moment that fans rushed barriers to get into the event. Now, again, this is online for you. Just go to KSAT.com. How about some good news now? Just hours after our reported six, it was found. An update on this sculpture that was stolen right before Luminaria. Well, organizers for the Light Festival confirmed the serpent sculpture sculpture was found tonight. Four local artists created this art piece for that event. In a Facebook post, Luminaria says the serpent will require some repair work. They also confirmed some equipment is still missing, but they plan to get everything together by Saturday's event. San Antonio police have surveillance footage from a possible suspect, but as of tonight, still no word on any arrests or any charges in this case. Tonight, we're learning more about the crash that killed a football player from Tyvee High School. The driver who was in the car with him is facing an intoxication manslaughter charge. Investigators say that Jonah Kai Stone was speeding. 17-year-old David Palestrant and two other people were in the vehicle with him. Stone ended up hitting another car. Now, Palestrant died and the two other people who were in that vehicle got hurt. We're told that the man in the other car was okay. 
In other news in San Antonio, police are looking for the person who killed 27 year old Daniel Flores. It happened last night near Southwest 36th Street and Jesse Avenue. Now, neighbors heard gunshots and called police. Investigators are asking anybody with information as to what happened to call them. It was a tragedy that should not have happened. That's how a local fire chief described the morning that two cars were swept away by high water, killing a woman and child. Seven people total were in those cars. Only five survived. Tonight we revisit St. Hedwig, nearly a month after the deadly floods. That fire chief tells our Myra Arthur the chaos began with the sight of taillights sticking up in the air. And you just heard the kids screaming. You heard heard the father screaming. Those sounds were the first moments of what would become heartbreaking days for Lawrence Padalecki Jr., his fellow first responders, and the town of St. Hedwig. There, the water was up to where that mesquite tree was. The assistant fire chief of Bear County Emergency Services District 12 was one of the first to arrive the morning of October 14th, following a night of heavy rains. A car was trapped in high water along Graytown Road after Martinez Creek swelled past its banks. And the only thing you saw were the taillights. So the taillights, that's it. That's yeah, and the taillights were up in the air. And so were the people he was about to rescue. The one girl was hanging onto a tree by herself and then uh, dad and the other girl was on another tree. As he kept saying, where, you know, you know, my daughter, my daughter. That's when they realized there was a child missing. As Chief Padalecki talked to the father, he learned that the car with the taillights up in the air belonged to someone else. It was probably about 20 to 25 foot deep in the in the creek bottom. The calm of the scene today. Actually, the marks are still there. Is in stark contrast to the race of the current that morning. A fellow first responder tethered him off and Padalecki jumped in upstream. I was able to climb on the car and the trunk was open and climbed on top of the car, opened the back door and the little boy and little girl just came climbing out. You know, they by you know, 12 to 15 inches left in the car. They're probably standing on their tippy toes on the, the seats to keep their heads above the water. And she's like, I don't know where mom is. I don't know where mom is. A woman was also missing. In total, one adult and four children were rescued, but the woman and five-year-old girl died in the water. Padalecki delivering an update at a press conference later that day. Because it shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have happened at all. What's the distance you would estimate from the road to where those vehicles I would say at least football field and a half. Padalecki grew up in St. Hedwig. He knows the areas that flood easily, and he knows they will again. He hopes that what his hometown has been through is enough to stop the next person from driving through high water. Don't chance it. Second guess yourself. You know, even if you're thinking about it, just second guess yourself and don't do it. Myra Arthur, KSAT 12 News. Like the fire chief said, it should not have happened. Just last week, St. Hedwig City Council approved the hiring of a maintenance supervisor to help prepare ahead of cases of bad weather. Prior to that meeting, the mayor said they only had two part-time city maintenance employees. The question if any road barriers were up before the flood still remains under investigation nearly a month later. Did those people even know there was water over those roads before they drove in there? Still a question tonight. We'll keep you updated. And now let's go to the border. That's where business is expected to return. The U.S.-Mexico border finally opening to fully vaccinated travelers. And there are lines in border towns from California all the way to Texas. Business owners here in San Antonio are also taking notice of this. Those at the Pica Pica Plaza on the south side want return customers. Now, between the closed border and the supply chain issues that we've been talking about, these businesses have been hurting, and they just want things to go back to normal. A lot of our shop owners um, travel to Mexico for the merchandise or the product um, that comes in and out back and forth. With more people coming through and help us uh, regain what we've lost. Now, to enter the U.S., Mexican nationals with visas need to prove that they receive the COVID-19 vaccine so they can either show a hard copy or a digital card. But by the way, that requirement does not apply to kids under the age of 17. 
Temperatures will be warming up a little bit for the next few mornings, not as chilly the next few mornings and overall a pretty comfortable week, but we do have another cold front to talk about that hits midweek and we'll talk about uh, how that's going to affect our temperatures in just a bit. Rain chances right now not looking all that good. See you in a few minutes to get you ready for the rest of the week. All right. Thank you, Adam. You know, it's something that affects all of us, yet you hardly hear about it redistricting. Yeah, it's a political process that affects who represents you in the state and U.S. House or Senate, and that impacts local projects, what you pay in taxes, what happens in your schools. It's really important stuff. So that's why Steve Spreester and I are so excited to discuss it with you tomorrow. We're going to have a live stream. It's called Out of Bounds Repercussions from Redistricting. So join us. It starts tomorrow at 7, right after the 6 o'clock news, and you could watch it live on KSAT.com or on our KSAT streaming apps. And we want your questions yes, as part of it. It's part of a discussion. We invite you. All right. My remedy is I try and scare people. <laughs> but one local doctor coming up with his own remedy against hiccups, the tool backed by science coming up. Yeah, you're going to want to stick around for that one. Now, as San Antonio experiences a rise in anti-Semitic signage, there's an event to stop the hate that's set to kick off in less than 24 hours. And tonight, we're going to hear from the Anti-Defamation League about the way to fight hate. And it's day two in the trial against three men accused of murdering Ahmed Arbery. One investigator recalling why fingerprints could not be recovered from a crucial piece of evidence. It's next on the night beat. He was jogging right before he was killed. Unsettling body camera video shown on day two in the murder trial. Those of those men accused of killing Ahmad Arbery. The three men accused of chasing and killing the 25 year old were in court today as well. Jurors squirmed in their seats as investigators identified graphic images that she took of Ahmad Arbery's body. Sergeant Sheila Ramos also testified that because the shotgun was covered in blood, fingerprints were not recovered from the weapon on the scene. Father and son Greg and Travis McMichael and their neighbor William Bryan charged with murder. Defense attorneys say Travis McMichael fired in self-defense. Now, unfortunately, we are seeing more anti-Semitic signage. It's something that we're seeing right here in San Antonio. And we had a deep discussion with Mark Tubin. He's the regional director of the Anti-Defamation League Southwest. He was here for KSAT Q&A, and he discussed how events like the January 6th insurrection can play a role in that increase. And he said that there's one way to fight hate, educate. Anti-hatred starts in the home. And it starts by showing and providing examples of how people should be treated uh, and when it's appropriate to, to take a stand and when it's appropriate to say something and when it's appropriate to report an incident. And incident reporting, by the way, is a really important piece. In fact, so important that the ADL created a database on its website where people can go and report hate crimes. But you know what? There's also something that you can do locally, and that is to show support. There's a unity event tomorrow in San Antonio. It's for any and everyone who welcomes diversity. It's going to be at the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg campus of the San Antonio Jewish community. It starts at 615. But before you go, you have to have to have to register online. And we have a link for you on our website, ksat.com. Well, you brought it up. It's part of that story, but more subpoenas actually issued in the January 6th insurrection. The committee investigating the riots wants to hear from six associates of former President Donald Trump. Those associates include Michael Flynn, who was a former national security advisor. The committee wants to discuss allegations that the associates paid for hotel rooms that served as command centers ahead of what happened on January 6th. Now, on a lighter note, I know you've had this before. Have you ever had the hiccups, but you just couldn't get rid of them? Well, one doctor, a local doctor, is trying to help you with that. He's Dr. Ali Safi. He's a neurointensivist. He says that hiccups begin with a diaphragm spasm. Now, the nerves alert the brain to close the throat. So guess what he did? He came up with a fat straw with a tiny, teeny, tiny, precise hole. And it sounds super simple, but Dr. Safey told our Marilyn Moritz that it's kind of tricky to use. You need to, yeah, sip through it like, yeah. right. Sort of faking out the brain. Yeah. 
All right, I hope it works. Yeah, Me the, too. The pressure lowers the diaphragm and then interrupts the hiccup cycle. Now, a published study found that it worked nine out of ten times. Pretty cool. Wow. If you want to learn more about that special straw, you can head to our website, ksat.com. And, yeah, I would think the kiddos would be excited about that. Nine nice out of ten know. times is yeah, much better than my boo method. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to scare you? Yeah, boo. Uh, yeah. Or what's your mother's maiden name? Your hiccups are gone. That whole thing. <laughs> 18 right now. We're getting a live look at our city right now. Not too much traffic right now. Weather's kind of decent, at least compared to what we dealt with last week, right? Adam? Right. It's comfortable outside, that's for sure. And it's going to be a pretty comfortable week this week. And morning temperatures are actually going to be a little bit warmer than what we've had lately. We're looking at morning readings largely in the mid 50s tomorrow by Wednesday. We're looking at lower 60s. That's with a little addition of humidity in the air. But if you like those crisp mornings in the 40s, just wait till the weekend and we'll be there behind a cold front. OK, let's talk temperatures and take a look at our time lapse of the sunset. And by the way, if you notice that bright light near the moon, just under the moon this evening, that was Venus followed shortly thereafter. If you look above the moon on the western horizon right now, you'll also see Jupiter and Saturn. So to answer some of those questions of those bright lights in the sky, Venus was just beneath the moon and then we had Jupiter and Saturn. So 49 this morning, still a bit of a chill in the air today. We topped out at 78, which is four degrees above average and high temperatures for the most part were well into the 70s, even in the lower 80s in spots. I mean, Pleasanton 83, Del Rio, Criso Springs 81 and Catula, the warm spot today at 85. Right now we're sitting pretty at 61. We have some high thin clouds streaming overhead. They gave us a pleasant sunset and they'll be overhead throughout the day tomorrow. A dew point right now at 56. So yes, it's not necessarily feeling sticky and muggy outside, but that is an increase in moisture content in the air compared to what we had over the weekend. And now this time of year we have longer nights, more time to cool off. The air temperature drops down to this dew point temperature. We get that thick dew and even fog. So this morning we had fog. Tomorrow morning, next couple of mornings, we'll probably have some fog. And these dew points, you know, humidity is going to be somewhat noticeable, especially as we get into Wednesday before the cold front hits Wednesday night. And then again, another little uptick on Sunday. But we're not looking at any kind of humidity that I don't think folks would complain about anytime soon. Actual temps now, 55 Kerrville, that's one of the cool spots. 70 in Carrizo Springs, 64 in Gonzales, 61 New Braunfels. Tomorrow morning, this is what we're expecting. Mid to upper 50s, so 56 Canyon Lake, 57 in Hondo, about 59 the start of the day in Elmendor, 55 Bernie, 57 Timberwood Park. By the afternoon, a little more cloud cover than sunshine, but we should still warm well into the 70s, right near 80 degrees. I mean, we're talking 79 Lackland, 77 Converse, and Timberwood Park about 77. We'll be near 80 the next couple of days, then a cold front hits, putting us back to 70, and then we'll see the temperatures just bouncing around from near 70 to the mid 70s to round out the work week and get into the up, upcoming weekend. And you look at our satellite and radar, these high thin clouds streaming overhead this evening, going to stay in place through the day tomorrow. They're coming off the Pacific. We have the big blue H overhead. Our next system is this dip in the upper level flow that's heading into the Pacific Northwest. That's good rain for the Western US, but it's not going to bring much here. 10% chance basically Wednesday night. So patchy fog in the morning at 57, then right near 80 by the afternoon. And Thursday, Veterans Day behind the cold front, sunny but breezy, low humidity, and most of the day spent in the 60s. All right, Adam, thank you. Greg, not all is well in Longhorn Land. No, it is not. Not only did they lose a game. Yep. They lost a starter. Yeah. Joshua Moore, remember, he's the guy we reported on last week that supposedly had a confrontation with the head coach and an assistant coach, and they kind of downplayed it, saying, it's really not that big a deal. Well, it apparently was. <laughs> when we come back, Longhorns coming up four games in a row, losing them, and now they lose a starter. We'll talk about that when we come back. And is UTS UTSA getting enough respect when we come back? Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Lawford. One of the bright spots in the Cowboys' stunning 30-16 to loss to the Denver Broncos on Sunday was a play of rookie linebacker Micah Parsons. He was a monster on defense. He had two and a half sacks to go along with his ten tackles, including three tackles for a loss. Who knows what the score would have been if Parsons had not stepped up. He now has three and a half sacks on the year, joining DeMarcus Ware, Victor Butler, and Anthony Spencer as the only Cowboys linebackers to record at least three sacks in a rookie season. Parsons was asked how much of his game has grown in just a short period of time after his first multiple sack game as a pro football player. 
It all starts with the details throughout the week. Uh, Coach Q puts a lot of time with me uh, throughout the week, dying up rush plans, dying up individual time with me. So I think each week I'm getting better and better, and I'm learning and learning more about being a pass rusher, timing, things like that. And I think it's just really uh, growing for me, and it's going to keep adding to our game plan. Now the loss ends the Cowboys' six-game win streak. Now they host the Atlanta Falcons on Sunday at noon in AT&T Stadium, where Dallas is nine-point favorites. After scolding the media for reporting an altercation between wide receiver Joshua Moore, head coach Steve Sarkeesian, and another assistant coach that occurred last Wednesday at practice, Moore has entered the transfer protocol, meaning he's no longer with the UT football team. Moore did play on Saturday in the 30-7 loss to Iowa State, but only caught two passes for 32 yards. After Sark told reporters on Thursday that was much to do about nothing, saying verbatim to the outlet that reported the altercation, it was their bad, not ours. After being outscored 27 to nothing in the second half on Saturday night, Sark was asked today about the status of more going forward. The plan for Josh is to go into the portal. Um, and that's, you know, that's his his option or his opportunity to do that. That's what college po football provides. Uh, and we wish him the best of luck. After bullying starting quarterback Casey Thompson after the two for six start, replacing him with Hudson Card. Sark says both quarterbacks will be reevaluated this week to see who starts Saturday at home against one and eight Kansas at 630 p.m. where they hope to snap out of their longest losing streak since 2010. The UTSA Roadrunners are now 9-0, but just ranked 15th in the country by the Associated Press College Football Poll, moving up only one spot from last week despite a dominating 44-23 route of UTEP on the road. Undefeated this far into the season, the Roadrunners are in some pretty good company with number one Georgia, number two Cincinnati, number four Oklahoma, all 9-0 as well. Now they have a very good chance of going 10-0 when they host 1-8 Southern Miss in the Alamo Dome this Saturday afternoon at 2.30. One of two home games left in the regular season. It will be interesting to see where the college football playoff committee ranks our roadrunners tomorrow. Big game in our big game playoff covers is also the case at Texas Sports Productions Game of the Week. Thanks. The big game in our big game coverage this week in the first week of the Texas high school football playoffs features number three and undefeated Johnson Jaguars against number eight ranked New Braunfels Unicorns. The Jaguars are one of four teams to finish the regular season at 10 and 0, including number one ranked Brennan, number two rated Steele, and number four Alamo Heights in 12's top 12. They have one two offensive punch behind their running back Ben McCreary, who has 20 touchdowns on 1,438 yards rushing. Quarterback Cruz Kerwin has 1,647 yards in the air for 19 touchdowns. Jaguars closest call was their 46-43 overtime win against Reagan. The New Bravos Unicorns come into the postseason with an 8-2 record with their only losses to Smith and Valley and Steele. They have a very similar 1-2 punch in quarterback Aiden Bauman, who's thrown for 1,686 yards and 20 touchdowns, and running back Riker Purdy, who has 947 yards on the ground, 9 touchdowns. Now they meet in the bi-district playoffs. Phenomenal. I mean, just making school history, it's awesome. But knowing the goal we have in mind is all eyes on state. So we don't want to focus on anything else but one game at a time. So this is our mindset going into New Braunfels. I am expect us to come hit us in the mouth and I'm to do the same. Our team's ready. We have a game plan. I trust my coaches. I trust my teammates. And I, I just know we're going to come out. They're obviously a great team. They're 10-0. They're in a tough district. Uh, they got a lot of athletes. They can find a way to win. Should be a good challenge for us, but I, we can get it done. Playing these teams that, you know, usually go far in the district, you know, our district usually goes far in playoffs, and um, this competition, you know, really prepares us. All right, the Jaguars are hosting Unicorns at Heroes Stadium this Friday night at 7, and our big game is also the KSAT 12 Texas Sports Productions Game of the Week. You can see over the air live at 12.2 or on the BGC app. Our San Antonio Spurs teamed up with the city of San Antonio to renovate this court at West End Park with a new Spurs-themed court. It's one of the 40 Spurs-branded courts and park refurbishments as part of the team's four-year, $1 million commitment. Both Trey Jones and Zach Collins are on hand to help out with a little basketball clinic that followed. Being able to affect, um, you know, kids' lives uh, means the most to us. Um, you know, like Zach was saying earlier today, it's not about, you know, the player you are, but about the person you are. And um, I think things like this go much further um, in, in people's lives than, you know, whatever we're going to do on the court. So they got good things going on off the court. Now they can translate that and now on the court. That would be yeah. nice. Yeah. yeah, we're hoping. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank we'll you be right back. back. Tip for the night beat, GMSA at 4.30. Have a great night.